Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing our series called Understanding the Jews. We are now in lesson number 82, and the title of tonight's lesson is The New King Stumbles. So last week, uh, we studied how King Saul had won a great victory over the Ammonites, and in so doing, he then established himself as a man who was worthy of his position. He had been successful in obtaining the admiration and the loyalty of the people. <clears throat> but <clears throat> at the end of our lesson last week, we said that Saul was about to get his first test after procuring the support of the nation. In horse racing terms, Saul had come out of the gate well. Uh, he went right to the front. Uh, his victory over the Ammonites had done that for him. But most racetracks are not laid out in a straight line. Uh, they have turns. And when Saul got to the first turn, he stumbled. He lost his footing. Circumstance from which he would never recover. For Saul, <clears throat> getting to the finish line would have meant winning the prize of a dynastic kingdom. A kingdom where his throne would have been passed down to his sons for generations to come. Saul never got to that finish line. He never finished the race. And none of his sons would ever become king. But what happened? How could this man who started out being so humble in spirit and respectful of Samuel, how could he end up being disqualified from the race? Why was it that God rejected him? Well, let's take a little time to observe the progression, or more accurately, the regression in Saul's character. And I want to start by looking at the scriptures in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The scripture reads, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and the 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. So, it seems that at least for the first year or two of Saul's reign, uh, everything was pretty peaceful. We don't have any record of anything significant or any pressing difficulties facing the nation. But in verse 2, we see a change. It seems that after a period of a year or two, Saul began to get more comfortable in his role as king. He began to understand the power of being a king. And so, now begins the process of the fulfillment of prophecy. Daniel had warned the people that a king would take their sons and make them soldiers to serve in the king's army. Now we see it happening. Saul looks over prospective candidates among the people, and he drafts 3,000 men into his service. This marks a substantial change in how Israel had always fought its enemies. In the past, whenever a need would arise, the people would come together <clears throat> to fight as the circumstances required. But afterwards, they would disband. They would all return to their homes. This was different. 
Saul had now created a standing army. An army that would always be there in peacetime as well as in war. And that professional army would have to be paid. We all know how that's done, right? Taxes. How could the people complain? They were warned, but what was it they said? We want to be like the other nations. Well, the other nations supported their armies by taxing the people. And now Israel will do the same. So now Saul has an army. It was an ill-equipped army, but an army nonetheless. It was a group of choice men, handpicked, who, given the resources and the opportunity, could be quickly whipped into a fighting force. And I say they were ill-equipped because the Philistines had made sure of it. They had strategically taken away the ability of the Israelites to make any weapons. How so? Well, at this point, I'm going to skip forward in the scriptures a little bit in our current narrative to cover how that was done. And then we'll come back and resume what is going to be the beginning of the end for Saul. So I'm going to go to 1 Samuel now at chapter 13, but forward to verses 19 through 22. And the scripture reads, And there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, was there found. So, uh, we can see what the Philistines did. They didn't rely simply on issuing some kind of prohibition against the Israelites, uh, against them making any weapons of war. They went further. And what they did was very effective. They removed all the forges from the land of Israel. That meant two things. First, there was no place where metal could be forged into weapons. And second, since there were no forges, the men of Israel would not have the need, nor would they have the opportunity to learn the trade of a blacksmith. They were deprived of both the resources, listen, and the skills necessary to pose any threat to the Philistines. Without those forges, the Israelites could not even make the tools necessary for farming. And as the scripture informs us, they had to go to the Philistines to get them. Once they did get them, they did at least have the ability to sharpen them. But that was all. They could not make them. So at that time, the Israelites would only have had perhaps slings, uh, wooden spears and arrows. Uh, and farm implements from or with which to fight. Not a good match for metal weapons made exclusively for anti-personnel use. The only people in all of Israel who had swords were members of the royal family, most notably Saul and his son Jonathan. The Bible doesn't tell us how they came to be in possession of those weapons. Of course, the Israelites would have been able to pick up the swords from the fallen Ammonites whom Saul had defeated previously. But because the Bible tells us that those weapons were not to be found in Israel, 
most probably is the case that they were confiscated by the ruling Philistines. However, history does show us that pretty much as long as wars have been around, so too have arms smugglers been around. People who are willing to provide arms for the right amount of money. So, either Saul was successful in hiding his swords from the Philistines, or he bought them from entrepreneurs outside the country. And it goes without saying that Saul and Jonathan would have been among the very few in Israel who would have been able to afford to pay the price, which would have been quite high. Any way you look at it, Israel's situation concerning weapons was pretty dismal. But before we get into the confrontation that was about to come, I wanted you to get a, a picture of the predicament that Saul was in. That's why we, we skipped ahead and then came back. It doesn't seem that Saul was in the best position to raise any serious challenge to the Philistines. In fact, we're going to find out that it wasn't Saul who, if I can use the term, fired the first shot against the Philistines. Let's go to 1 Samuel 13 and verse 3. Scripture reads, And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. So before we get into what's happening here, I want to show you a slide uh, that's labeled Exhibit 107. This map will give you the location of the various cities that are mentioned in this section of 1 Samuel. <clears throat> Cities that were used by the Israelites and the Philistines for either gathering sites or camps or battles. So the first thing I want to point out, in the bottom right of the slide, you're going to see a square insert that shows you where the larger part of the slide, which is the blow-up part of the slide, where it's located within the country of Israel. And the Philistine garrison in Geba would have been just under and a little to the left of the red teardrop that's in the middle of the slide. And Jonathan and his thousand men, according to scriptures, would have been just a few miles southwest in Gilbia. So they were pretty close by. King Saul and his two thousand men were split between Michmash and Mount Bethel. Now those two locations were on the other side of Geba from where his son Jonathan was. And Michmash was quite close to Geba, while Mount Bethel was a little farther away to the north and the west. But none of Saul's or Jonathan's forces were any more than perhaps four or five miles from Geba. So we're talking about a pretty tight area here. So we see in this third verse that we read that Jonathan <clears throat> attacked this outpost that was in Geba and he killed the Philistines that were stationed there. Now since we've gone over how ill-equipped the Israelites were, there's an assumption made that this particular garrison would have been quite small and probably not well defended. Thus, an easy target for a thousand men to overcome, which Jonathan had at his disposal. And so they did. Now this attack on the Philistine garrison raises an important question. And it's a question that cannot be answered with absolute certainty. If King Saul ordered this attack, he would have done so knowing that it was an act of war. And without any surprise, that, uh, that attack did in fact start a war between Israel and the Philistines. 
The question that no one can answer is whether or not King Saul himself ordered this attack, or whether his son Jonathan did that on his own. If Jonathan did it on his own, King Saul may not have even known about it until after the fact. Think about it. Saul's forces, the Bible tells us, was in Michmash. That was just one mile from Geba, the place where Jonathan attacked the Philistines. One mile. His troops were closer than Jonathan's. But we are not told that they were involved in this battle at all. Why wouldn't they be? Remember, just before this incident, Saul took the initiative and he led the people to victory over the Ammonites. Why now would he take a back seat <clears throat> excuse me, and instruct his son to start a war with the Philistines while he remained at his campsite? Well, we're not told outright. But I believe the biblical evidence that describes Jonathan's character weighs heavily towards Jonathan taking this action on his own, without his father's knowledge. Jonathan was a brave man, and his nature was to take the bull by the horns. He was not one to hesitate in the face of opportunity. And the thought that Jonathan acted on his own at Geba gains credence when we consider that this was not the last time that Jonathan acted in such a manner. So, before we move into the ramifications of his attack at Geba, I want to jump forward in the scriptures to the next chapter, and then again we'll come back. And I want to do it so we can see if we can identify a circumstance that is consistent, consistent with the idea that Jonathan also acted on his own at Geba. So let's go to 1 Samuel 14 and verse 1. The scripture reads, Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not, his father. Now this passage is describing a later time in a different place where Jonathan will once again initiate an attack against the Philistines. But this time we're not left to wonder whether or not he was operating under his father's orders. The scripture says explicitly that Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. Seems that patience was not one of Jonathan's stronger traits. He was a man of action. And when he identified the need for a certain course of action, he went for it. So now that we've got a better picture of Jonathan, let's go back to see what happened as a result of his destruction of the Philistine garrison at Geba. So I want to reread 1 Samuel 13, 3, one more time. The scripture reads, And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. So Jonathan strikes the match. The Philistines hear what he did. And Saul blows the trumpet and tells the Hebrews to hear. Hear what? Well, let's look at the next verse. 1 Samuel 13, 4. The scripture reads, And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. This is interesting. The Bible says that Saul blew the trumpet. And Saul provided the message. But the message didn't match up 
with what actually happened. The message that the people got from Saul was that Saul had smitten the Philistine garrison at Geba. But that's not what happened, is it? Why would Saul put out that false message? Well, here seems to be a good time to share what the Jewish scholars believe to be the fatal flaw that would ultimately topple Saul from his throne. A fatal flaw. It's something that is certainly not unique to Saul. In fact, in some measure, it has an effect on all of us. But people who are in positions of leadership or some form of special social prominence have a particular danger of being consumed by it. The Jewish rabbi Joseph Telushkin identifies it as Saul's desperate need to be liked. Saul craved adulation. He wanted the people to think highly of him, to say good things about him. And in order to get those things, Saul was willing to compromise his obedience to his God. That fact will make itself known as we get a little farther along in Saul's reign as king. If Saul's off to a bad start, he had misled the people as to what happened at Geba. But in addition, we learn from verse 4 that because of Jonathan's attack, the Philistines viewed the Israelites as being abominable. Why would that be the case? It's certainly understandable for a country that is under occupation to fight back. And the occupiers might not be happy or Please, if they did that, but they wouldn't consider their fighting spirit to be abominable. In fact, they probably wouldn't even be surprised by it. Unless. Unless what? Unless there was an understandable reason for the Philistines to view the Israelites in the way that the Bible tells us. There's a strong opinion that the Philistines looked upon Israel as an abomination because Israel and the Philistines had an arrangement. Now, it is not known whether it was a formal treaty or just a mutual agreement, but it seems that there was, in the Latin, a quid pro quo, something for something. If Israel would agree to pay tribute, taxes, which is what they were doing, to the Philistines, in exchange, the Philistines would provide peace and security and a fair amount of autonomy <clears throat> to the Israelites. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it seems that for a period of time, that mutual understanding was working. So, when Jonathan unexpectedly attacked the Philistine garrison in Geba, well, the Philistines viewed that as a form of treachery, as an unprovoked attack during a time of peace. And thus, they viewed the Israelites as abominable. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the Philistines were going to be enraged. They were not going to take this challenge lying down. There was going to be retaliation of the highest magnitude. Saul knew this, <clears throat> excuse me, and accordingly, he commanded the people to gather together in Gilgal. So I want to go back once again to exhibit 107 to see where Gilgal is located. So again, if you look on this map, you'll see a gray area on the right side of the slide and a squiggly blue line running through it from the top to the bottom. That blue line is the Jordan River. And Gilgal is located in the gray area about 10 or 12 miles east of the Philistine garrison at Geba that was destroyed by Jonathan. Now, 
you may have seen in your private studies that <clears throat> the name Gilgal appeared in more than one location in ancient Israel. Part of that may be due to a disagreement among scholars, but it's also the result of uh, the name of a city being in multiple places, same name. That would not be all that surprising. Uh, in fact, in our own country, America, there are numerous examples of cities carrying the same name. For example, there is Kansas City, Missouri. There is a Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, same name, different places. But the clear winner for that circumstance has to be the name Washington. In fact, in America, there are 88 towns with the same name of Washington. So, there were a number of camps or towns in Israel that were called Gilgal. I know of at least three. But the Gilgal that appears in the gray area that I showed you on our exhibit is the one that's being referenced in 1 Samuel 13, 4. But why Gilgal? Why did Saul choose to assemble the people there? Well, this particular Gilgal is far and away the most important and the most significant of them all. And it's not even close. This Gilgal is the very first place that Israel lies when Joshua crossed the Jordan. This Gilgal is where the Jews commemorated the miracle of God drying up the Jordan before them by placing 12 stones on the West Bank. That was in Gilgal. This Gilgal is where the people were first circumcised when they entered the Promised Land and just before the Battle of Jericho. This Gilgal is where the Jews celebrated their first Passover in the Promised Land. And perhaps the most compelling reason for Saul to choose Gilgal was that Gilgal was the place where Samuel renewed his coronation as king. And that's where the people celebrated his ascension. Seemed like a good place. So King Saul <clears throat> removes himself and his troops back towards the Jordan to give himself some extra time to make preparations for the storm that is surely coming. He commands his subjects to come. But here's the thing. Would they come? And if they did come, what would they do? What was Saul's plan? It's easy to start a war, much harder to win a war especially a war against what appears to be a far superior opponent. But Lord willing, when we get back together next week, we will see how the people responded to the king's call. Please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. And until we meet again, Shalom.